And good to see you, Faith Community Church. I know, doesn't that look great, right? Yes, yes, it's coming along. Uh, well, Pastor Mike said we ran out of money here. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> no, we just ran out of time. But it's going to be done. There's more that's going to happen up here. It's going to look great. Very worshipful. It's going to be done by December 1st when we start our Christmas services. Uh, so be sure and be back here in uh, Hopkinton on December 1 for Christmas services and to see how all this really ends up. Now, as Antonio mentioned, we're in socks today because we're partnering with the Framingham Public Schools to provide 1,000 sneakers, new sneakers, for kids that can't afford them. They're already rolling in next week when we're all together in Framingham at Walsh Middle School at 9 and 10.30 for the two services we're going to have there next week. Will you please bring your sneakers then? That's what I'm bringing mine. If you can't be there next week, bring them here on December 1, and we'll make sure they get to the Framingham schools then as well. And here's a way to remember what sizes to bring. It's between 11 preschool, 11 size 11 preschool, and youth 7. Preschool 11, youth 7. You know, two lucky numbers, right? 11, 7. Preschool 11, youth 7. Those are the sizes, everything in between. Bring one, two, three pair, whatever you can do. Uh, next week, we're not going to be here next week. We're going to be in Framingham. Now, those of you who just daydreamed for a moment, be sure and hear this. <laughs> we're not going to be here in Hopkinton next week. No services here at all. We're all going to be in Framingham at Walsh Middle School, November 24th. That's next Sunday. There'll be two services. Thank you. Yes. There'll be two services, one at 9, one at 10.30. It's a big auditorium, 600 seats, and uh, we're all going to be together as one church. And it's, it'll be a real big blessing to be there. You might have to drive five or 10 minutes more. It's not a big deal. It's only 20 minutes from here. And uh, you will be blessed by being there and having everyone all together. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to give you a roadmap where I'm going this morning. First, we're going to look at a widow and her very simple gift that Jesus honored. Then second of all, I'm going to talk to you very personally about some bondage I was in for a good number of years and how God set me free and can set you free too. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about how to, be, how to have freedom in Christ and to live lives that are generous lives in freedom and in worship of God. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious and almighty God, we gather in your name here in your place of worship. We pray your spirit would be present to quicken to our minds and hearts, bring alive to our minds and hearts your word as we need to hear it individually and as a church that we might serve you, love you, know you, and share your love to the world. In Christ's name, amen. All right, second book of the New Testament was written by a guy named Mark. He wrote an account, The Life of Jesus, and we pick it up here in chapter 12. As Jesus taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. Now, the teachers of the law were the, the religious leaders in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. They liked to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. Now, you know, I think about scriptures like this one and others in the Bible where Jesus is kind of making fun of the religious leaders of his time. And I think to myself, maybe I should have been a school teacher. <laughs> you know, or gone into business or be a scientist like my dad. I mean, this is kind of a high calling that Jesus holds religious leaders to. You know, not to be full of yourself and draw attention to yourself, but
but to the person of the Lord, to God, who is everywhere and amongst us. Now, look at the way Eugene Peterson translated this in the message. Watch out for the religion scholars. They love to walk around in academic gowns, preening in the radiance of public flattery, basking in prominent positions, sitting at the head table at every church function. Look at this, preening in the radiance of public flattery. Is that sort of like this? <laughs> you know? Is that what preening is? <laughs> so Jesus, again, mocking the religious leaders who call attention to themselves at the expense of the one to whom they were supposed to point. And when it comes to who gets to be at the head of the table, you know who I think that needs to be here at Faith Community Church? The volunteers. The people down in Faith Kids right now teaching our kids. The, the volunteers in student ministry with our youth. The people who make coffee across the way. The Stephen ministers in our church. Those are the people that I honor and respect. And it's how they give so much for us and for our community that our children might know the Lord, that people might be ministered to. Uh, those are the people who I want to give those seats of honor to. Amen? All right, we continue on in the text. Jesus talking to the religious leaders. They, 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 they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. Now, I kind of wondered, what is it Jesus means by they devour widows' houses? He might have been referring to this. In the temple in Jerusalem at that time, uh, there was a distribution that went to widows. Now, widows and orphans were the lowest people on the social totem pole in Jerusalem at that time. And the reason why is because they had no families. So widows uh, were alone. They had no social security because social security was family. That's how you were provided for in your older age. They were often destitute and impoverished. They were nobodies in the society of that time. And the way the temple tried to provide for them was by having a daily distribution. This was something like a food pantry where every day they could get some food and survive. Now, there was another thing that was offered to some of the widows in Jerusalem, and that is around the temple courts were these dwelling places. And, you know, I, I could call them apartments, but they were nothing like apartments we have today. They were very simple little abodes. And uh, the, the temple authorities would allow widows to stay in them, to house them, to have some kind of shelter. But the religious leaders, just before Jesus came on the scene, decided that the temple wasn't grand enough. It was already incredible. And so they expanded it, and in the expansion, they took out a lot of the widow dwellings and made some of them homeless. So I think that's what Jesus is referring to here. The preening religious leaders, <laughs> were so into themselves and ignoring the fact that in their grandiose schemes, they were leaving widows, the most powerless people in their society, homeless. And when you read the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, over and over and over, the prophets are saying, don't forget the widows and the orphans. Don't forget the widows and the orphans. Make sure you take care of them, and thereby you honor God. And this is exactly what the religious leaders of Jesus' day in the temple courts were not doing. And Jesus is outraged. Now, I don't believe he hated the religious leaders. I rather believe he was outraged because they were full of pride and not making sure the widows were loved and taken care of. So God is outraged when we do not love, when we get so full of our own pride and arrogance that we leave behind those closest to us 
who are most in need of our attention. And that's why Jesus was so upset. But the text goes on. Now, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings would, were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Now, if the first part of the scripture didn't make me uncomfortable, this part makes me <laughs> uncomfortable, right? Jesus is sitting there at the treasury watching everybody's offering. This would be as if everything we gave uh, in charitable contributions was on Facebook, in public display. And it wasn't just Jesus watching. Indeed, in the temple courts where the offerings were taken, it was a very public thing. There were 13 offering boxes. And the offering boxes had these big horns uh, coming out of them, big brass horns. Um, and they, it looked something like this. Remember those old record players? <laughs> Not that you ever had one, but you've seen pictures, right? So coming out of the offering boxes were these horns, right? And people would walk by and put their offering in these brass horns, and the offering would go down into the boxes. There were 13 of these all around in the offering area. And it made noise because, of course, the only currency they had in those days were coins. They didn't have bills. And the rich were uh, especially fond of these things because they brought in big bags of coins and would stand at one of these horns, right, and pour their coins in. Now, if you've ever been in a casino and someone got a jackpot, what happens, right? You hear the coins all coming out, makes all this noise. Well, this is the opposite. <laughs> This is coins going in to the, uh, to the box. But it sounded something like that. Clinging and clanging of coins. And people are watching what everyone's giving. And the wealthy people walked up with these big bags and would pour coins in, right? They didn't want to go too fast. They want everyone to be seeing what they were doing, right? And then clinking and clanging of the coins. And the more you had, the more people ooed and awed at your offering. And remember that at that time, it was believed that the more money you had, the more wealth you had, the more blessed you were of God. And if you wound up like an orphan or a widow, it means something you did or your parents did had caused God to look with disfavor upon you because you were poor. So these people are not only being honored for their wealth, but for their perceived religious stature before God. So that's the context for what's going on here. We turn now to the next part of the scripture. This is uh, where Paul uh, talks about rankings of people. The widows and the orphans, the lowest, the wealthy people on top, and the religious scholars... And this is what Paul, one of the early Christian writers, wrote about that kind of ranking of people. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying uh, right here, this cuts across the social rankings of our society. And all of us are on a level playing field before God rich or poor, Greek or Jew, male or female, slave or free, we're all equal in the eyes of God. Jesus cutting to the chase of how God looks to the heart. We continue on. Mark 12, 41. Now many people, rich people, threw in the large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, 
put in everything, all she had to live on. Wow. So in the midst of all this clinging and clanking of coins and rich people pouring in these big satchels of money into these horns, in walks a nobody. Nothing in that society. Unnoticed, unremarkable, unloved. And she comes in with two little coins called leptons. Um, short in Latin, a mite, the widow's mite, you've heard. And she, she drops them in. And what is her two little clink clanks among all the clamor of the other coins going in. And who notices her? And who even cares about her stupid little offering? But Jesus saw it. And he calls together his disciples. And he says, you see all these other people and everything they're putting in? They're giving out of their abundance. It doesn't cost them anything. But her, she gave everything she has. She gave out of her poverty. I am humbled by this story. I hope you are too. And the way in which Jesus lifts up the lowest among us, those whom we would be tempted to dishonor or dismiss and brings down the haughty, right? Challenging us all in how we love and live for God. So what then does this scripture mean for us? How can we apply it to our lives today? First of all, now some are inspired to live like this widow. They give um, everything, or nearly everything they have and everything they are to God. This is our first application point for today. And there are many examples of this. Um, maybe you know of some, but I want to share with you one. It was a missionary couple. Um, and there are people I knew years ago, and they went to Ethiopia. He went to the same seminary I went to, I went into church service here in America. He went into a very rural place in Ethiopia. They lived there for 30 years. And it was among a very simple tribe out in rural bushland, Ethiopia. And then they came to America to share about their experiences uh, before going back with their church that they had established there. And uh, I had him speak at my church, but beforehand we had breakfast together. And after breakfast, I said to him and his wife, I am so in awe of you two, because unlike others of us who went into the American church, you went into the mission field and have lived an extraordinarily simple life. You have very little. And you built this little community of people who are nearly impoverished there in Ethiopia, and you've been there for 30 years. And I just want to honor that, that you've just given up everything to create this church and be this witness to Christ in Africa. And I just pray for you because of what you've given up. There's a pause. <laughs> and then he said to me, you don't get it, George. <laughs> Thank you for your prayers. But we pray for you. We have very little. But we are rich in what matters. While you, in the American church, you have everything, but are poor in what really matters. Wow. That was a zinger. <laughs> there are people who have given up so much, right? As an offering to God, to be God's servants. And some are called to that. 
and many I know who are uh, loving. Now, a second application point uh, of this scripture verse today is whether or not we are those kinds of people who give up everything for the Lord. We are called to live generous lives. No matter who we are, no matter our setting, whether we're in an American neighborhood or in a, in a small rural place of Africa, we are called as Christians to be sharing and generous with our lives. Now, <clears throat> I want to share with you my experience, which has not always been easy in this regard. When I left seminary, went into the church, we decided we would create a budget and right from the very beginning, make an offering to God and be consistent in it to match our values about that. So in the very beginning of having an adult-style paycheck, right, um, we decided we'd give 10% of our income to the Lord. We just built that into our budget from the very beginning. And then everything else would flow from there. That's easier to do, I think, when you're first starting off, is to say, I'm going to give this portion to God, and I'm going to build it into my budget, and this is, we're going to live this way because this is important to us for God. So all of our giving to the church and other charitable giving and Christian missions would equal 10% of our income. And then we uh, bought a little house. We furnished it on credit. And over the next few years, the credit card debt grew and grew and grew. And I began to get very anxious about how far we had gotten in debt. And then when I thought maybe we could get out of debt by doing a plan I developed one of my children got sick, very sick, deathly ill, for a 10-year period of time. And we had medical bills and debts that just compounded. So now, got all this credit card debt, and consumer debt, medical debt. And I was feeling so anxious about that and beginning, beginning to feel like it was a kind of bondage. Maybe you felt something similar in your lives where debt was just so big in your life it was crushing you and robbing you of joy and freedom. And that's how I felt. And then my kids became college age and I wanted them to go to college. <laughs> and the parent plus loans. I was horribly in debt for a good part of my adult life. So much in debt that I really thought I was in a pit of financial despair that I didn't think I could ever get out of. Absolutely crushing. And I'm not saying this because this is a get out of debt seminar. It's not but because this crushes our spirit. It robs us of joy, right? It is a kind of bondage, a form of chains wrapped around us that can be so horribly oppressive. That's how I felt. And perhaps some of you have felt that way too. Maybe some of you feel that way right now. Well, I want to share with you the way I got out of debt. At least the crushing debt. I still have a mortgage. The first thing is, I made a decision to get out of debt. I was determined to do so. You know, it's like any other kind of bondage, right? You can live in it and live in it and live in it until you decide you've had enough. And it's time to just get out of it. It starts with saying, I'm going to get out of debt. Second of all, I prayed. I prayed every day before God about this financial bondage that God would give me the strength to endure it and to see a way through it. And I worked exceptionally hard in order to do that. So thirdly, I had a plan. I developed a plan 
and I stuck to it. Some years I did better than other years in sticking to it. Sometimes there were circumstances beyond my control that that's the worst part, right? <laughs> that interrupt the plan. But nonetheless, I stuck to the plan and eventually navigated my way through it all. It was hard. You know, generally speaking, for most of us, we didn't get into debt in a short amount of time. And we're not going to get out in a short amount of time. It takes discipline. And I found strength in the Lord to achieve finally financial freedom. But it was a hard journey to get there. And I share this with you because there is hope for you too. You can do it. You can get to a place where you are finally free. And we can help you do it. So we have something called Financial Peace University here. Uh, we're teaching that all the time. And it's a way to help you learn how to manage money or to get out of debt. Uh, we're running this class all the time. You can find out more at the Hub if you'd like to be a part of that. The second thing we have is we have financial counselors. So we know this is a problem for people. And we have people here who help you make a plan so you can get to a better place and be free of this crushing kind of uh, spirit, this terrible bondage that you can find yourself in uh, financially. Um, also, there's an uh, elder in our church, Elizabeth Grady Harper, and uh, she has a curriculum called uh, Lazarus at the Gate, and it's a small group, uh, a faith group, that we do uh, on a short-term basis here periodically. And it's about living a simpler life, how to live a simpler life, a more responsible life, and a debt-free life. And that's also really excellent. When you see that coming up, I encourage you to sign up for it. I've been through it, and uh, it's just an exceptional program. We run that periodically here at the church as well. So I want to share with you now a third application point. And that is, no matter who you are, whether you've ever been in debt or not, or in financial chains or not. Develop an economic value system that you live by. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that your, your finances stem out of your faith and your finances stem out of a value system that uh, makes sense to you and that gives you a sense of financial freedom and that you are investing in the things that matter most to you. There are a lot of ways you can think of this. I'm going to suggest just one. Some other churches talk about this. And it's summarized in three words. Give, save, live. I particularly like this one. So give, in my case, it was 10%. By the way, the, the numbers don't matter. It can be 1%. It can be a half percent. Don't get hung up on the numbers. Whatever's right for you, whatever God's calling you to do in whatever way, but for me, it was 10% I give, 10% I save, and 80% I live on. So 10, 10, 80, give, save, live. Give because as Christians, we're generous people. So whatever number you plug in, plug something in. This is your generosity to the church, to Christian charities, to nonprofits, to the things God calls you to support that are outside of yourself. Then save, because children get sick. Uh, the roof caves in. The boiler breaks. There are times in which you need a savings, right? And to fall back on that. And then 80% or whatever number. You know, it can be 1, 1, 98%. Whatever number fits you, plug in the number. So you give, you save, and you live on the rest. And then recently I heard another fellow talk about this in a little different way. He said 10, 10, 10, 70. And his formula was give 10, save 10, invest 10, and live on 70. That might take more discipline. <laughs> but 
Wow, if you start that as a young person, I say this to young people all the time, and they just kind of blink at me. But I'm really hoping and praying that some get it. If you start that as a young person especially, and actually do like percentages like that, 10, 10, 10, 70, then that will also help you be in a place of financial freedom so you don't go through that crushing kind of anxiety of being in debt like I was at one time in my life. Now, again, don't be hung up on the numbers. Um, you know, especially if you're um, really struggling financially, you'll do those numbers differently. That's not the point. You can't buy your way into heaven. God's not going to love you anymore depending on how much you give or how much you save, right? That's all through the blood of the Lamb of God. I'm just talking about achieving a place of financial freedom, not because, again, this is a debt-free seminar, but because God wants us to be free people of any kind of bondage, no matter what it is. All right, let me close with this. Uh, there was a farm, and it was in disrepair. The farmhouse was, you know, kind of broken down, shutters hanging, doors falling off. The farm equipment was rusting. The field was a mess, and the young couple bought this, and they worked for years on it, and they got it looking really great. So they asked their pastor to come have lunch with them after church. So they're driving down the drive. The pastor had known this farm for some time, and as they're approaching the farmhouse, the pastor's looking around, and he exclaims to the young couple, and he says, wow, it's amazing what you and God have done with this farm. And the wife responded, you should have seen it when just God had it. <laughs> you know, God has given each one of us a little land to till. For some of us, it might just be a tiny plot. For others, maybe it's bigger. That doesn't matter. What matters is God's given each one of us a little land to till. How are you going to tell yours? Let us pray. Lord God, first of all, I pray for those in this room who really feel like idiots, like I did, who feel stupid, like I did, who feel like they made financial mistakes, like I did. And also pray for those who didn't do any of these things, but just life happened. And these people, Lord, feel themselves right now just under a crushing load of debt or financial problems and just wondering if they can ever get out of it. Pray, Lord, for them right now that you would encourage them. Give them a spirit of compassion for themselves to know that you love them as children of God and desire them to be free of this kind of stress and anxiety. Lord, that you would come into their lives and give them hope and the power, Lord, to be determined that with you, partnering with you, change their lives, begin the road to freedom. Pray for the Lord now for all of us in this room that we can all learn to be more generous people. No matter who we are, no matter our means, that we can be a witness to you through our giving, the giving of our time, ourselves, our money, whatever you call us to do. For you have not withheld you, your only son from us who went to the cross for us and we desire to return our lives to you. And now, Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are the one through which chains fall, fear bow. Here, now, Jesus, you change everything.